Welcome to On Surviving. My name is Megan, and I'm a survivor. And my name is Nobly, and I am a survivor. Together, we are bringing On Surviving to the world because it matters. On, on it, sorry, it matters to me because alongside the potent fears of her frail hearts is so much hurt, loss, and trust issues that I often had to navigate through all alone with very little resources and zero trust. Um, I, am this, I am passionate about doing this project because I get to be that trusting person, <laughs> to be there and help with the resources that I never had and hopefully make a difference in people's process of surviving. And it matters to me because I want others to recognize the deep strength and rich humanity involved in every step of the process of surviving the tragedies life brings many of us. I suffered silently and alone for too long, and I wanna help others to find hope more quickly and readily and feel and be less alone in the process of surviving. On Surviving Matters, you matter and we matter. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for, for joining us. As always, we get started off just checking in on how we're doing because we show up, well, shoot, we show up exactly as we are uh, and, and try not to put on too many airs. And there are lots of things that can affect how, how that is. So let's just go ahead. I'm going to um, share my screen. Here, give me just a second, um, because we check in on these seven wellness factors, um, thinking about um, a, a scale of from five, um, outstanding, amazing, could be, you know, the best it possibly could be, uh, or lousy, um, and really about the worst it could be. So, um, hey, Nobly, why don't you start us off today, uh, checking in on how you are on each of these. Okay. Um, physical, about a three. Uh, my knee's been really bad this week and I've been more active, but it's been hurting a lot. Um, intellectual, say a four. I've been learning new things and, you know, trying to do more research and learn more things, go deeper into the learning, which is cool. Um, Ironically, uh, with the topic and everything, emotional is horrible because um, I have to take, you know, bipolar medication and depression medication, and um, most all of my medications are on auto refill, and um, and so I, I do my, you know, meds up in a seven day planner, and um, I don't really pay attention to the bottle much except for when I'm, you know, loading my thing. Anyway, long story short is I. I ran out of my bipolar med oh. and was, and was out of it for like four days. And I, it, I, it was, a, I was a mess. And then I couldn't, my pharmacist couldn't, it, it took two days after I realized that I didn't, you know, have any to get some. And so it just really, it affected me a lot. Um, and my spiritual self kind of suffered too, as a result of that, cause I was really funky. Mm. Um, environmental was, it was okay. Like a three, um, social, um, the, the work aspect of it and the coworker, you know, the office aspect of it was good. Cause I mean, it has to be, but, um, my personal self, I isolated, um, and occupational is really good. I'd have to say that one would be a four or five because I love my my job and I also uh, absolutely love doing this. So. Mm, mm, that's it's, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the last part's awesome and yeah. other good parts in there too. I'm curious yeah. about the meds part. I'm just going to stop sharing for a second so we can chit chat. Um, uh, does it take when you don't take it for a day or a few days or something like that. Does it take a while for it to start um, working again or does it have other effects? Yeah, it does. It um, This one particular one, you're never supposed to just abruptly get off of it because of this very reason. And what it does is it makes you like, like, de like so sad, like 
Mm. just like the saddest and um it physically makes you feel weird you know shaky and and you know just clammy and out of sorts right and i'm on the you know i'm on the maximum you know dose and stuff and so then when you finally do get it um you have to gradually work yourself back up to it you can never start at the dose that you you know have and so after the four days of not having it then i had four days of a, a fourth of the dose that I'm supposed to have. And then, you know, we're talking like eight days later, I'm feeling better. Wow. wow. And so that, and it's a really, um, it's not, it's not good. Yeah. Yeah. So. Are there ways to, um, to prevent that from, from happening when, I mean, I, I it seems like it could be a, a system failure and I'm just curious if there's a, a way to, that that could be better. Um, I think there, you know, there is because it, it, there has to be, because in the past, um, my organ health plan lapsed, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever reason, I, I don't, I don't remember. Maybe I, uh, I didn't have, they didn't have the right address, didn't fill it out or whatever. But mm -hmm. so when it was time to get my mental health medications, I went to get them and I had no coverage. Mm -hmm. Mm. And I couldn't, I couldn't get the letter to tell me you have no coverage because I was, you know, couch surfing or whatever. Right. And so I, um, I had no medication. So I had to scramble and try to find somebody to help me fill out the app and try to get, wow. you know, and it was, it was two weeks. I wow. want to say closer to three before wow. I was able to get my medication. Wow. And during that time I did have a, yeah, some suicidal ideation, you know, I, I, I feel like we should, this is a, this is a big topic. And what, what comes to mind is people who are living with unstable housing or, or, you know, completely, you know, unhoused living on the street and, and yeah. happens to be a pretty high rate of people um, struggling with mental health issues and yeah. to not be able to have reliable access to your medication is, is a big crucial. Deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, so, so noted, we can maybe even, yeah. you know, maybe we even, that comes up more in our conversation yeah. and when our guest joins us. Yeah. So, yeah, you uh, betcha. so well, how uh, are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> oy, 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 how am I? All right. Well, let me, uh, <laughs> let me share my screen again so I can, uh, okay. Um, physically, yeah, you know, physically I'm actually doing okay. I, you know, I, I'm, I haven't been exercising as much with my move, uh, for folks who don't know. Um, I just, just moved back to the States, uh, about four days ago. Um, and so, <laughs> um, I've been, you know, moving around a lot because of that move, but I haven't um, had my rate reliable yoga practice that I normally do in the morning. Um, so I'm just a little bit off because of that physically, um, but not too bad. Um, uh, intellectually, um, I'm gonna go ahead and put that at, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna put it at a three. I'm gonna go three emotional, uh, three spiritual, three environmental, three social, and three, let's just threes all down the board um, because uh, largely affected uh, by this move. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been, I wanted to stay where I was. Um, and uh, I was very much in love with it. Um, and I, you know, and I'm counting my blessings for the, the fact that I keep getting to do this. This is just absolutely um, a, a wonderful um, high part of, of every week. Um, all the different parts I get to work on with on surviving. Um, uh, but, you know, I gave my occupational uh, a three because um, everything's just kind of out of balance right now. I'm not able to do as much of the things that I love. Um, I, I actually still have one lingering consulting project, um, which is actually a pretty cool project, but it, it takes away. Um, and so, um, just, yeah, uh, it, basically all of the factors, uh, in here have something to do with that, that move, except for the, actually the social piece. I had, a. 
a recent, um, because of me trying to put things in balance in my life, I um, decided I needed to make a change in, in one of my uh, business, uh, you know, one of my side hustles, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, which is with, an, with uh, a, a, a really important friend to me. Uh, and that friendship is uh, a little bit on the rocks at the moment because I chose to take care of myself. Um, and to prioritize the things that I said I was going to uh, prioritize for now, which is my writing uh, and healing. And yeah. um, I just realized I was stretching myself too thin. Um, and this move and coming back here, I'm just like, I don't want to waste this opportunity. Things change. I have a real opportunity here. And so um, I, I fully believe I'll be back on the, the upswing um, as oh, we yeah. go forward, I'm just happen to be, <laughs> we're here at a time that really I've, this is the best I felt in, in five days, probably <laughs> it's <Yeah>. been a <laughs> rough go. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> eh, it is what it is. Um, there has been worse and, uh, I'm very grateful to be here with you and very grateful, um, uh, that, uh, our, our guest, uh, will be joining joining us and which brings me around to what we're here to talk about today. Uh, we're here to talk uh, about our experiences with mental health systems, what's been helpful and not, um, plus some ideas that could um, make mental health systems even more helpful. Um, and uh, of course, as always, I want to remind folks that we speak candidly uh, about our experiences and that can be triggering for some some folks. So if you're dealing with some, you know, tough, uh, uh, trauma in, or other, other kinds of struggles with, with mental health, uh, issues, um, we just really want you to want to encourage you to take care of yourself and to know that you can turn this off. Uh, you can go hug a loved one. You can get on the phone and call a crisis line. If you just want to talk to to somebody and you're uncomfortable talking to, to maybe a stranger. So um, on that note, let me just go ahead and share uh, my screen one more time so that y'all remember um, that you are not alone and that you matter. And if you're struggling, we really want you to reach out. Um, and if, if for some reason, um, like I said, if somebody, you, you feel like you don't have somebody, you can't go to people that, you know, um, uh, or you just want to talk to a, a stranger because you don't want to have, you know, any guard up around what you're saying. Crisis lines are available, uh, anytime for free, wherever you are in the United States, just dial 988 in Mexico. <laughs> my former home. <laughs> uh, uh, dial 800-911-2000. Uh, and you can go on Wikipedia. There's a, a list of uh, crisis lines, suicide hotlines uh, for all sorts of countries around the world if you're coming to us uh, from there. So uh, please, please do take care of yourself. Reach out. Um, if you want to listen some more, you can come back. Uh, yeah. and maybe listen with a buddy. Um, so, uh, with that, um, let's go ahead and start with our experiences, um, uh, before we bring on our guest. Um, and I think I'm going to, I'm getting us started here today. Yeah. 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 So I wanted to actually start, um, by just reading a really, really brief paragraph, you know, we, for folks who may not always know, may not already know, we do um, write blog articles on, on the theme that we're, we're talking about. And so just briefly, this, this paragraph, um, I wrote toward the beginning of mine, um, says, I spend a lot of time talking and writing about my aggravation with people asking me, have you gotten counseling? That question and others like it uh, feel like people are trying to get me to shut up, go off into a private corner to talk about these uncomfortable, sometimes horrifying things. And sometimes I want to cry with someone who loves me, feel less alone with this ho horror in the world. 
sometimes I need the people in my daily life to understand what is burdening me. Sometimes I just need a break. Sometimes though, I truly need professional guidance. And um, I wanna, that is super true for me through much of my life. In fact, um, at least as early as 11 years old, uh, I was in need of, of mental health care um, because of uh, childhood sexual abuse I experienced um, at that age. And then, um, of course, over time, other, um, other experiences, other traumatic experiences layered on top of those and, and made my need for, for help um, uh, even more significant o over time. Um, though, as I've written about in, in a number of things and talked about a couple of times, my, my very first experience uh, with, with counseling at 11 was horrifying. Um, and it, where it was a, a really bad counselor who asked me if I liked it, uh, when I was abused. Um, and then again, I, I didn't, didn't get care again until quite some time later. Um, but, um, you know, I guess, and I actually want to go through some of the array of things that I've been through, um, it, and that I talk about in that piece. Um, but first I did wanna point out that when I'm talking about needing care myself, what I'm, I am talking about um, a, a wide variety of issues. I have a few key diagnoses um, that I have needed treatment for. Um, one is post-traumatic stress disorder um, from that childhood abuse, um, which actually was compounded then by um, sexual assault when I was a teenager um, in, in high school uh, by peers. And then, um, and then again, um, uh, I had a, a new PTSD diagnosis after the accident uh, that I was in with, with my daughter that took her life. Um, and then as with all of that, um, diagnosed with major depressive disorder and panic disorder. Um, and interestingly, uh, I was actually reflecting on some of my, my early experiences. So like the first point I was making, I think the really kind of, um, take away what I'm thinking about mental health systems and my experiences with them is that, um, at some really key points, um, uh, they were absolutely critical. It was critical for me to be in therapy. It was critical to me that the crisis line was there. It was critical to me that there was a psychiatric hospital that was able to give me the care uh, that I needed, um, especially at that, that very, very um, early, that, that first, not, not, the, not the 11 year old encounter, but my next encounter wasn't until I was 19. Um, I think, I mean, I was really both scared off of, of working with a counselor uh, because of that experience at 11, but also just societally, it was like something was really wrong with you if you were going, it, that's how it felt to me anyway, if you're gonna reach out uh, for care. And um, so, and, and at 19, I was having massive panic attacks and I had no idea what was happening to me, what was going on with me or why I had major, major depression. Um, and I attempted suicide. Um, and luckily someone found me and got me to, to the hospital. Um, and of course then was on a 72 hour hold as required by law. Um, and um, luckily had some really wonderful people there um, who were able to, um, help me understand, I think the, really the basics, um, that of what was happening to me. Um, and, um, I really wanted to, um, and really should have gotten more care from there. I'll talk about that actually in a minute. Um, but I also wanted to, to talk about a couple of other times when it was really critical uh, for me and it really, really saved my life. Um, so that next point was then again, after 
after Jasmine died, after the accident, I couldn't, um, I couldn't close my eyes, whether, <laughs> you know, like a, a long blink or um, trying to sleep at night without seeing my daughter's body floating down there. I, I mean, or hearing my screams. It was so horrifying. Um, and so obviously I'm still a little, um, this is that three level three showing up where my, uh, I get, I get choked up. Um, anyway, um, so EMDR, uh, uh was a, a treatment that, uh, used for PTSD, both, uh, for my childhood sexual abuse, uh, as well as for, um, after the accident and, and really helped me to be able to, um, engage life, um, <laughs> at, at least get me to do uh, relatively to zero. Right. Um, and, and, uh, helped me to, to be able to, to move forward from there. The next time, um, that I really was my life was in danger it was actually when I, um, I had actually, I, I had started, um, drinking and abusing drugs really heavily after Jasmine died. Um, and I, uh, when I did quit, um, later, um, things got really bad because then all of a sudden I had to face everything, um, without a crutch. And by the way, I was, I, I realized sometime later that I was abusing drugs and alcohol prior to that also as a part of a crutch trying to, you know, deal with, you know, avoid dealing with all of the other trauma that I had had previously. So when, um, when I was no longer using, um, everything was really there and by then, you know, I had burned some bridges and folks weren't super psyched about <laughs> being there for me. So I was really alone. And um, unfortunately, at that point in time, I didn't have uh, health insurance. Um, and but um, crisis line I mentioned before, say it, it was everything uh, to me. I called a lot. Um, luckily, I was able to actually go see somebody in person um, who is also a crisis uh counselor at a crisis clinic, uh, near me. Um, and so wonder, it was a wonderful thing that, that those, those were available to me, uh, at that time. Um, now <laughs> there've been other times when I have been in some kind of therapy, um, including recently, I've been finally able to do that grief counseling that I should have been doing after EMDR for my daughter's uh, death. And, and frankly, I should have been doing more of that kind of work early on in my 20s as well. Um, but I have uh, finally really, really found um, uh, some a, a therapist to work, I work really well with. Uh, and I feel like really hears and, and it, gets me and is able to, to help me. Of course, that raises all sorts of, you know, stuff to the surface. So it can have an impact on daily life. You can feel a, a bit more, more raw. Um, and, you know, so that's even when there's great therapy. And of course, there's other things like the hospitalization, which was really quite traumatic um, of its own right, um, being strapped to a, a gurney for hours without um, people talking to you or letting you know what's going on is uh, in and of itself um, quite terrifying. Um, and so I guess what I want to say about that, though, is not as a as in, you know, oh, you bad mental health system, but um, to, to, I mean, there's a number of things system wise that I think that the system, especially our, our emergency uh, med mental health care systems um, can do better. Honestly, even that ongoing system where, you know, people have challenges with access to care, I think um, there are things we can do better. 
Um, but I guess when I, when I'm talking about this part where, um, therapy has been almost as traumatic as the original trauma at times is that I want to impress upon our personal support systems, how important it is for you to be there, uh, for your loved one that is suffering. And so when you're saying, you know, Hey, nobly, if I'm saying, Hey, nobly, I really hope um, you know, I'd really think it would be helpful for you to see and talk with a counselor about that, somebody who really understands, you know, what you're going through and can help you work through it and give you some good tools. Great. Great. That's all good. And I, I want to encourage, you know, someone like me to say also, and hey, let's plan a regular coffee or let's, you know, to, to just show up and just plan to be there as a regular support. Um, yeah. So that to me just feels, that helps kind of bridge that that gap in, in that part that we just know it's, it, yeah, therapy's good. And you know what, it's hard. <laughs> and so we we need our, our loved ones to be there, there with us too. Um, yeah. A couple other points I, I just wanna make, make real quick. Um, in my experiences where I have, um, there have been some points like right at following that 19 year old, uh, suicide attempt, um, as well as after I got through EMDR, when, after Jasmine died in both of those circumstances, I did not have health insurance. And so, and I, I was in, you know, when I was 19, I was in college. Um, shortly after that, I was pregnant. Um, I was paying for college by myself. Uh, I was w- working my way through it. I barely had enough money to get by. I certainly did not have enough to pay uh, for therapy. Um, and then then later, um, after, after Jasmine died and I was no longer employed, getting employment with health insurance. I also just wasn't in a place to be able to pay for that ongoing care. And, and so that, uh, and it is expensive. Uh, and I think we as a society should, uh, and could do better there. Um, because that, that's just, um, that is, is a major gap. One thing I do want to say is I want to see more places like be like the state of Colorado, uh, which has a program called I Matter, um, and that offers up to six free uh, counseling sessions for young people 18 and under, and actually 21 and under if receiving um, uh, special education services. So, um, and I tell you what, if that was available to me, that might have changed just about everything in my life. Um, you know, it, it, so. Um, yeah, anyway, we could definitely use more, more access. Mental health care shouldn't be, uh, just available for people who have money. Um, that's a yeah. big, big, big gap. Um, and then I guess the last thing I want to say, there's a couple more points in my, the piece that I wrote, but I'm going to, I'm going to save them. I think for now, what I just want to say is that in my experience over the years, when I have reached out to find, uh, some kind of therapy. There's all sorts of different kinds of care, mental health care you might be able to access on an ongoing basis. Um, and it's um, and it can be kind of hard to find the right fit. So I always encourage my friends and you know others that I talk to um, to um, interview and you know do your best to like think about what it is that you need, what will be helpful for you, and to you know read about you know do a search online, but also call and you know and actually interview that potential therapist, right? Yeah. So um, so you can get as close as possible, and even then, still there may not you know may not be the right fit, uh, and just encourage folks to keep going back um, and, and to to. Uh, work through it and and to have the courage to make that change uh, when you know it's not the right fit. And also sometimes to look yeah. at alternative things like I have, especially in these later years, found uh, mind body work, meditation, uh, especially guided meditation uh, and, and yoga to be an important part of my mental health. 
Um, and um, shoot, I am feeling, as I said so many earlier about the, the baddest, toughest, I don't know, amazing me than I've probably ever felt in my life. Uh, and, uh, and I'm going through some shit right now. So, um, anyway, uh, that said, no believe what the heck where, you know, what, tell us a little bit about your experiences. Um, uh, I should have had like you, I should have had, um, you know, therapy as a kid, some form of counseling. Um, I had, you know, trauma that started from a very young age, but um, I had four traumatic events. You know, um, we're Native American, I'm Native American, and I was raised in that culture. And we're just not, we are taught from a very young age that you just don't tell anybody anything. Mm -hmm. And so counseling, even after my brother was murdered as a child, wasn't even brought up one time. It just wasn't something that was ever an option. Um, and so I had four traumatic events before the one that I start my piece with um, that should have also, um, I should have had some form of therapy or counseling for those events that, again, it was just never even brought up. And then um, I start my piece talking about how um, I was sexually assaulted at 13 and my virginity was taken and I literally had nobody to talk to. I've never felt so alone or, you know, scared in my life. I, I just had nobody to talk to at all. And so um, as a result of that, I just started acting out in other ways, experiencing with drugs and alcohol, uh, running off, you know, ditching school, all of those things. And um, nobody, you know, took the time to find out, you know, why, why I was doing that. It was just like, she's a bad kid. She's a loser. She don't run around with her. She's bad news, you know, until, um, I, I had a suicide attempt, you know, the short, not too long after the sexual assault. And, um, and even right after, you know, of course I got taken to the, you know, the, the native clinic and all of that. But even after that, it was, I, I felt shame. I was shamed either by my parents saying, you know, my dad saying, what, what is wrong with you? to the parents saying don't ever hang around her to people mm -hmm. going what a weirdo you know and so instead of getting the help I needed I got shamed mm -hmm. and you know again nobody took the time to find out why you know what's what's wrong and so finally after a while of that I got sent to a counselor for the very first time and it was a Native American counselor and um, she had known my dad probably knew my grandpa, I don't know, but knew me from, you know, little. And um, she, she broke every single bit of confidentiality that she possibly could. She told my dad everything that was said. And as a result, she, she ruined me for ever wanting to trust a counselor. And not to mention, my dad was livid, just livid at me. And so it was already that there was already a tension there, you know, now it's like, it, you know, it's even worse. Yeah. Um, can I just say, can I ask you, I, as I listen to that part of your story, nobly, I I'm, I'm struck by the fact that, um, you know, that for at you, if you're native American, uh, African American, you know, if you are a, a person of color, it's oftentimes really hard to find a really great counselor who, um, understands that your, your culture and, you know, you don't, have to get through this, this big cultural barrier to even begin to like take care of your human needs that you're showing up for. Um, yeah. And I'm just, uh, and it strikes me at, at what a devastation that would be that, you know, you, you should be getting some good, good care here. And, and unfortunately that closeness um, helped you know, with her, with your father um, made it just such yeah. an opposite experience. Um, have you thought about that much? And um, has that changed how you think about going 
to therapy? I'm just, I'm just curious about what that effect. Was. Um, that ruined me for years, for, for years and years and years and years. Um, I, I, I didn't trust, trust anybody. And, you know, in between the years, um, between when that happened at 13 and when I finally got, you know, some, um, some help after my second suicide, suicide attempts, like in my twenties, um, so much more happened, you know, so many more traumatic events happened. And it was like, I, I'm, I don't two more suicide attempts, you know what I mean? And it, it, it took, it took so much for me to even go in there. And it was pretty much, you know, the hospital that was like, you need to go to, you know, such and such County health right when you leave here, you know what I mean? And I, um, so again, I agree with you. The first three, n- I didn't feel like they gave two shits about me. I felt like they had never been through what I had been through and they were looking at their book going, yeah, you know, I just felt no love, zero love. So then it was when, you know, tried to go through those three totally turned off again. And uh, in between all of this, I, um, I developed a substantial substance abuse problem, like, like uh, the worst it could probably be for me. And so then I heard things like, oh, it's the dope or she's a druggie or, you know, it's like blaming it on the substance abuse when that wasn't it at all. It was all the the mental health that I needed help for that I never got that caused me to self-medicate all the trauma in between, you know, but it was labeled as, you know, that I was an addict and a lost cause, but nobody... And that was before I had my diagnoses of um, bipolar two and manic depressive and severe anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. And so at that time, all that was going on, I didn't know. I just, you know, I just, it wasn't, didn't get any men- mental, you know, health help. So um, I, I did eventually after my son passed um as an infant i um you know it it was still two or three years after that but um i started to get people um i was on the streets and nobody wanted to even look me in the eyes let alone you know let me in their establishment to dry off let alone try to let me have a conversation with them to tell them where i was Mm -hmm. you know and i went to um I did go to a, a, a homeless shelter and I was met there with love and everything, but there were so many people in there, so many, you know, residents in there that needed the love and the, you know, that there just wasn't enough people to go around. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was going to bring this up a little bit later, but it seems appropriate. Now I think it would be so amazing if retired counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists could volunteer their time to go and, to these mental hospitals and be readily available, you know, certain this to so many times a week or, or, you know, whatever, and, and be there for, um, for the, the residents of the shelter. Yeah. Cause that's something that would have made, that would have impacted me tenfold. Like that would have been a complete game changer in my life. Already felt like nobody loved me. I was separated from my family. I, I just, that would have, that would have been a game changer. So Mm -hmm. um, I just think that that would be, that would be incredible. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, yeah, I I will, I'll say really quickly that I did work with a community. Uh, I won't say which one, but I I did work with a community once uh, on homelessness issues where there were some individual retired counselors who actually went and um, showed up at, at a regular place where people who are unhoused uh, or very unstably um, housed would be on a reg- on a daily basis um, just to provide that good human contact. And, yeah. um, and it was incredibly valuable, but they were like, we have to keep it on the down low because we're not actually allowed to do this. And that is just, uh, <laughs> that needs yeah. to be fixed. Like that's just such an easy fix that <laughs> there should be, um, no barrier to doing that. People who know what they're doing, um, to yeah. be able to volunteer their time in that way is, um, 
is incredible. So yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry to interject again. <laughs> no, no, I'm glad that you did. And then um, I'm sorry, I kind of got to just peek at my notes really quick, but um, but what did work for me was, you know, obviously a good counselor therapist um, being on the right medication, which I feel often felt like a guinea pig. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't feel good when you're trying to figure out what the right one is. But I just encourage I encourage people to, you know, to stick with it if if that, that's what you you need for your mental health, because for me, it's it's really good now. Yeah. And that is that takes um, a, that's a huge part of it right there, as you can tell, as in my you know, wellness check in that it's not good for me when I don't have it. (laughs) And then, um, I, on my third suicide attempt, uh, overdosed on heroin, um, shortly after my son was uh, died and, um, I was dead. I took a a couple things of Narcan. I'm such a survivor of that or a supporter of that because I wouldn't be here. So if you go to your local pharmacy and ask for Narcan, they will give you one. It's really easy to, to use. I just encourage people um, to have that in case they come across somebody that is, you know, overdosing. Yeah. And, and then, anybody um, can and anybody can have that, right? Anybody can have it, yes. Yes. And with the opioid, the opioid and the fentanyl, you know, um, epidemic, like I have, well, not and plus the job I work, but I have four just in my car. Awesome. Um, and so um, and then uh, uh, the understanding of my community that I live in and, and my family and just anybody that comes across me, you know, again, we don't know other people's struggles. And so who are you to be mean or judgy or hurtful or shameful or especially shameful? Don't ever, I don't care who you are. And then um, the biggest one for me, this one is something that you already mentioned, but is, um, is follow up. You got to follow up. Because often after the suicide attempts and after the immediate hospitalization, like nobody, it was like, it never happened. Nobody checked on me. Nobody, you know, um, nobody followed up. Nobody ever once was like, I, like you said, like, I want to make a special day for you or what can I do for you? What, what would you like to do to make you feel better in your mind and your heart with your mental health? What is something, do you want a teddy bear? Do you want a weekly coffee meet? Do you want a a hug, you know, a text, a heart, anything? Um, It just didn't happen. And that is so um, critical and because it, it goes far beyond the event itself. For sure. For it sure. goes far beyond. And so that, that is like the, the, the main, the main thing for me mm-hmm. um, is, is the follow-up and the follow-up may look, may not look like two days later. It may look like seven months later. It may look like, you know, Years. there's no time. <laughs> yeah. Here we are. You know what I mean? I still want checked on, you know, I mean, <laughs> honestly, mm-hmm. so um <laughs> I just, yeah. one more point too, is that, um, you know, I had that experience with the counselor um, on the reservation that I grew up on that my father still resides on. Um, my father's had extreme trauma, the murder of his only boy, like on and on. And, and uh, it, it took him 75 years mm. to seek any kind of help because of his culture and his, wow. you know, tradition, 75 years. Wow. Until recently, well, it's been a year or so now, um, he bucked up and went to seek some help. Awesome. And this, this same place where I was so, all my experience, well, he found a, a wonderful, wonderful therapist. It's mm. paid for by the tribe. He's an elder, as should be, mm. um, with extreme confidentiality and for this man who is about any it, it talk is um like telling me about it mm, mm, so awesome. so my heart is overflowing because all of those little me's mm-hmm. 
that are running around there now have somebody. Mm. So that's, mm. that's amazing to me. That's beautiful. It is never too late. <laughs> no, it's yeah. not. So, I mean, and the other thing is too, um, if you're, so I, I just had just real quick, I had a couple incidences lately. Um, I, I work with, um, families that I'm family preservation, which needs, um, such a wide array of, um, help. And uh, I would say three quarters of them, um, if not even more than that, need mental health help. Mm -hmm. Most of them are poverty, poverty level, right? Most mm -hmm. of them depend upon the state insurance. And um, this particular mom and her 11-year-old daughter that both have had substantial trauma. Anyway, I have been on the phone, I'm talking for five weeks now. Wow trying to find somebody that had openings for a child and a mother individually and together who had state insurance. It took five weeks to finally find one. And then their appointment was scheduled two months out. Mm, 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 so that, mm. that's not, that is so bad. And then yeah. the second, I think something's got to be different on that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, and, and sorry, go ahead. No, no, go, you go ahead. Oh, I was going to say our guest tonight has, I think some stuff to say about that yeah. too. Um, but I don't want to cut you off. So no, I can't wait to introduce her. She's wonderful. And she has uh, so much wonderful things to say. And this last very last thing I, I wanted to say to you was, was um, my my young adult nephew was um, stabbed himself in the heart not too long ago and was hospitalized. And then there was in this entire state of Oregon, which is where I lived, there was no, not a bed. So for three and a half weeks, he sat in the emergency room of this tiny hospital and he just, just sat there. Mm, mm, mm. And so anyway, um, I'm really excited to bring on the guests too, but um, I just, yeah, I just want, I just want it to be easier for everybody of every race, every class, uh, every, um, you know, uh, income level, income level, every, you know, every situation. Uh, yeah. I just want it to be, to be easier. Yeah. So. Which is why we talk about these things. Um, I yeah. think we, we, buy, we find solutions in community uh, the same way we find healing in community. Um, mm -hmm. And I loved that, you know, that thinking about like even years later, somebody to come check on you. And our guest tonight happens to be one of my oldest friends uh, and one of the people who most reliably checks in with me uh, on my daughter's birthday um, every year. Um, I love her dearly uh, and I'm so happy she's she's here with us Uh her name is Christina Hallberg. Uh, she's also the author of The Violet Testament, her personal memoir and story of surviving her own major childhood trauma and living with bipolar one disorder. Chris, please do uh, join us and say hello. Hi everyone, I'm Christina. Yay. Uh, be before I announce myself, I'd like to acknowledge that Megan Picard and Lauren Jarvis are the editors of the Violet Testament, and I really appreciate their work on this. Oh, oh, that's sweet. I, of course, I only got to do some of the early work uh, on it, but really but happy. You, cha you changed the beginning of the book, so it's better. So <laughs> anyway, this conversation matters to me because the mental health and criminal justice systems have failed me many times. The things that have happened to me should never happen to anyone. Um, sometimes people will say, you know, you don't want to be a victim. Don't be a victim. You want to be a survivor. Well, I'm both. I'm very quite clearly a victim, but I'm also a survivor. I look forward to the dialogue today. I've had a lot of trauma in my life, um, beginning from when I was a small child and dealing with my father's paranoid schizophrenia. Um, so there was a lot of chaos in my life during that time. Um, I've been playing violin professionally ever since high school. 
I have a BA in psychology from the University of Puget Sound, where I was concertmaster of the orchestras there. Um, I was also concertmaster of the Seattle Philharmonic Orchestra for five years, and that was a really fun gig. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to give you the backstory behind my pen name, Elisa Gold. Elisa, because Elisa is my middle name, it's also a form of Alice, I believe the Russian form. Um, there's an Alice in Wonderland theme that runs through the book because it's like losing one's mind is like falling down the rabbit hole. So, um, so that's why Elisa, because it's connected to Alice. Um, what else? Interestingly enough, Alice in Wonderland's initial title was Alice's, Alice's Adventures Underground. So mm -hmm. I actually have a hard copy from a long time ago of the original. So it's been really cool. Um, and then gold, just because I wanted something symbolic and simple. Mm -hmm. So I think I've had PTSD pretty much my whole life, but I was diagnosed with a severe case of bipolar one disorder just after my 30th birthday. And this was really heartbreaking for me because my entire life, I had this fear that I was going to end up crazy like my dad. So that was a lot to deal with. Um, but these days, my psychiatrist has deemed my bipolar disorder in partial remission because I have not had a relapse in seven years. Um, I've been getting back into the violin. I have four wonderful students. A few more things about me. Um, I'm a cat mom and I have two precious little babies. Um, cats, <laughs> cats and music are my best medicine. I haven't had a drink in almost three years. And my favorite food is Indian. And my two most favorite artists in the entire universe are Chris Cornell and Prince. So love, love, love. <laughs> and I was really hoping you were going to mention the kitties because they yes. are super important. <laughs> they are. They're my kids. <laughs> yeah. And I refer to my cats as my therapy cats. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Emotional support animals. <laughs> for real for real oh uh, nobly i i um muted us both because we were uh having noise in the background but i know that you were wanting to to get in here to to ask uh chris a, a further no no okay um so uh so i will go go ahead then um really just just excited for you to show up one of the things i um always brag about you is um what an amazing um talent you have as a violinist um and it is so exciting to me um, to hear you play again and to know that you're teaching lessons again. Those kids are super lucky. Uh, <laughs> seriously, so, so lucky. So, um, yeah, so that that's super awesome. Of course, we've invited you here to talk with us about your your experiences with the mental health system. Yeah. Um, and you told us a little bit why why that's uh, important to you. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you will help folks. I think not everybody probably understands what bipolar one disorder is. Uh -huh. So wondering if you can just kind of tell us um, a little bit about that. And of course we heard Noble Lee earlier mention that she um, lives with bipolar two. So right. I'm wondering if actually both of you might help folks to understand those two diagnoses a, a little bit more before we go okay. into more. Um, bipolar disorder is a serious mood disorder that affects one's mood and their ability to function. There are two poles, depression and mania, hence bipolar. Um, bipolar one tends to be, oh, actually I forgot to say bipolar disorder is a spectrum disorder. It's a group of disorders that affect one's mood. Um, bipolar one tends to be more debilitating than bipolar two. Uh, Nobly, did you want to chime in the, on the difference between bipolar one and bipolar two? Um, I I don't know too much about bipolar one, but um, for for my understanding, for um, for bipolar one, the um, the 
mania is more far more extreme and the and it lasts um, far awesome. more long way yeah. longer um i was told by my um the therapist that diagnosed me was the reason why that i was bipolar 2 um was because my my manic highs and lows that didn't last um you know maximum of like four days See, at a time yeah, yeah. and bipolar and, one episodes can last for months and yes higher hospitalization so right. I guess if you if you have to have bipolar disorder you probably want bipolar too yes yes i um i'm the yes, lucky I, one <laughs> well i just i i feel for your you and my sister and you know so many others that have the bipolar one because it's yeah. it like you said it's it's, it's far, it is absolutely debilitating yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you yeah so, and when you talk about it being debilitating, of course, you have bipolar you know, diagnosis of bipolar one disorder in, in remission now, but it looks different on, in, on different days, right? right? Whether, you know, how, how it's showing up. Can you tell us just a little bit about how that shows up? Maybe a, a couple of different ways you might, um, it might show up in your life or how it, the bipolar what you manage. Disorder? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we're we're digressing from the uh, discussion guide. So let me just. <laughs> get that in here. Uh, okay. So in terms of bipolar symptoms, I don't really struggle day to day so much with bipolar symptoms anymore. Now that I finally found the right medication, which took 13 years. Wow. Um, I think the most thing that I struggle with today is adjusting to normal moods. Um. You know, for 13 years, I hadn't experienced a normal mood. So now sometimes when I get depressed or anxious, I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm going to get depressed again or I'm going to have a panic attack. So it's it's getting used to the fact that there are normal moods. Mm -hmm. And then once I feel that way, the mood will eventually pass and then I feel fine. Whereas when I was depressed, I never felt okay. Um, an example of a really bad day for me is something that happened just a few weeks ago. Mm. <clears throat> I'm very uncomfortable around the police because I've had several traumatic clashes with them where they manhandled me and terrified me. And so I'm just very uncomfortable with that. And um, the other day I went to 7-Eleven, it was a few weeks ago, to get something and I was standing in line. Well, a cop walked in and he was very big. He was a tall man. He was tall and muscular. And he proceeded to stand directly in line behind me. And my reaction was visceral. Like I, my heart was pounding. My mind was racing. It was fight or flight. I was like, you know, I think I was really nervous, especially because he was standing behind me. And um, the reaction was so strong that I almost got out of line. But what I did is just sort of deep, did deep breathing and then I was rung up and then I made it out of there. But that's an example of a really bad day because that trigger would throw me off emotionally for about a week. Wow. Yeah. So um, it's, you know, I, I need some help dealing with my triggers, which I'll mention later, but. Um, well, and, and uh I'm sorry to to interrupt you because, but when you're you're raising there, it's a really good example um, of of that trigger and that response and impact. Um, and of course, I know why that that trigger um, comes up. The next question I was going to ask you: If there are other parts of your life that are also dis difficult uh, for you and your sense of mental or or, or emotional well being um, on an ongoing basis, and 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 I know that you know um, that some of what you've just talked about is related to those things. So I wonder if you would you would want to talk a little bit about that as well. Can you restate the question? Sorry. Yeah. Um, other things that your other parts of your deal life that you're dealing with, not just you know not purely about bipolar one disorder, but other things yeah. that you're dealing with that are that are part of your story. Um, that. Um, you know, that whether you've gotten it or not, that you could you yeah. use um, mental health care for? Okay. Um, so the parts of my, the facets of my story that I think that could really benefit from mental health support would be um, to find a good trauma counselor who specializes in PTSD. Uh, I could use some help with my triggers, especially surrounding the police. 
I can also deal with, uh, I could stand to deal with a lot of the childhood trauma. Yeah. Um, in right now, I'm going to give an example of what my childhood looked like and the chaos. So it was a Sunday and I was about five or six, probably about five. And my mom and dad and I were going to the grocery store because my dad wanted to get aspirin because he thought the aspirin at home had been tampered with. <clears throat> so he was paranoid that day and I was bracing myself for the worst. So we go into the store, he was walking ahead of us and um, we were you know, behind him. And all of a sudden my mom grabs my hand and starts running out of the store. He's running after us. I get to the wrong side of the car. My mom screams my name. And when your mom screams your name in terror like that, it makes your blood run cold. So I froze for a second, but then I ran over to the right side of the car. We got in the car and we started driving off. Well, my dad jumped on the hood of the car. So my mom did kind of like a movie maneuver where she um, accelerated and then slammed on the brakes and then he flew off the car. And then I think after that, we had gone to my church or our church or something. But that's a prime example of stuff that happened to me when I was really little. It was very scary. Right. Right. Um, and, and, and you, you share, um, that story and other related stories yes, from your I childhood in your it. book, yeah. um, which, which is really great. Um, and people. dealing with the police. Yeah. Well, and, and I know this, this particular uh, episode isn't about law enforcement systems. I do right. think globally that we should have an episode talking about that um, because we do know so much um, in, in U.S. communities anyway. Um, so often law enforcement are responding to situations that are actually mental health situations and end up going through courts and jail system and, you know, the whole um, criminal system when it's actually um, should be in, in a healthcare system. Um, and, and that's part of your story, um, Chris. So I know we don't want to spend a ton of time there, but I do think it's an important part of your, your mental health story. So <clears throat> if you would want to just share, um, a little bit, uh, you don't have to either. So it's up, up to you if you want to share that or not. Okay. Let me just share more about, um, I'm sorry, share more about what? About the, uh, this part of your story that um, has the the negative inter interactions with law enforcement, the reason that you're ha having that that PTSD response to to the okay. officer behind you. Well, I won't. I don't want to give the whole book away, so I won't like the <laughs> details about the experiences I've had with the police. But I talk about it extensively. Yeah. Um, this is sort of towards the end of the discussion guide, but I thought it might be okay to bring it up here. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that would be ideal is when someone with serious mental illness is taken to jail, that the mental health system responds right away and intervenes. Mm -hmm. in, in 2014, I was sitting in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day for two and a half weeks before I was even evaluated. They kept me another eight weeks in solitary confinement before they transferred me to a hospital. This is not only inexcusable, it is criminal. And, you know, this is a prime example of the disconnect between the mental health and the criminal justice systems and I pay the price. Um, so it would be really great if there were more coordination and communication between both the mental health and criminal justice systems. Yeah. But that's about, all, you know, all I wanted to say about that. That's a whole nother topic for another yeah. Yeah. So. And, and hopefully you'll come back and talk with us uh, some more <laughs> about that because you yeah, do, sure. you do have a, a powerful um, story there. Um, so now coming back to two mental health systems that we're talking about here today, I talked earlier um, about my own mixed experiences um, dealing with mental health systems. I, I, I certainly know the same is true for you. Um, and want to take a moment here to talk about um, what has been good, um, what has been in your experience, what has been helpful for you. Like I mentioned, 
um, EMDR being helpful. One thing actually I didn't talk about earlier, but I did write about was important was that I actually got to see the same therapist for different treatments. And um, that was immensely helpful because I didn't have to start from ground zero in trying to then work on a new issue, right? Because I had already seen and gone through EMDR with that therapist um, on my childhood trauma. Then my, and that same therapist actually saw my daughter when I was separating uh, from her papa. And um, and then, so then that same therapist like knew, I mean, she knew us. And then when, when Jasmine died, um, was there to, to care for me. So, I mean, just how invaluable that, that, that was so, I, I feel so lucky. So anyway, huge thing um, that, that was powerful for, for me. And then of course, I also mentioned these um, mind body practices that have been helpful for me. So with that, what, what kinds of things have been helpful for you uh, in your experiences with mental health systems? Well, you know, with all that, with all the negative experiences, it's a little difficult to find the positives sometimes, but one, I can think of two. One is my first psychiatrist treated me for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, she was my, psych, my uh, psychiatrist and my counselor. And it was really nice to have that consistent quality care. Um, she was someone that the hospital could call, who could advocate for me, who knew me and my history and all that. And that was uh, a good thing to have that consistent care for so long. Unfortunately, she passed away in 2013. And so I lost that lifeline. The second example of something helpful was back in 2016. Again, I was scrambling to find a, a psychiatrist who would take Medicare. It's been a recurring theme. I write about it a lot. Anyway, so it was a mad scramble to find a provider who could uh, give me my meds. So I found, ended up finding a free clinic. And there was this nurse practitioner there named Katie. And she was really kind and supportive and everything. And she would make a medication change that would transform my life. She put me on Latuda. Latuda, for the very first time in my life, eradicated my depression. Wow. And it's really interesting because Latuda is not an antidepressant. It's an atypical antipsychotic that's used to treat bipolar depression and schizophrenia. So um, this, this was really an amazing experience with Katie because she actually did something to actually help me. <laughs> so um, <laughs> fortunately, here we go again. Unfortunately, the clinic lost funding and had to close. So then I had to look for another provider. And I would say those are probably the two positive ones. Mm. And um, that last one must have been life-changing. It was. I, I, it I was. Mean, it was like when I, I talk about this in my book, when I stopped being depressed and felt good and happy, I was like, oh, no, I'm getting manic now. But it really <laughs> like you couldn't even better. trust it. <laughs> yeah, I was really suspicious. I was like. I'd call my mom and I'd be like, mom, do I sound manic? And she'd be like, no, you just sound normal. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, right. and actually that you mentioned your mom too. Um, I know we don't always think about our personal support systems um, as being part of our mental health care, but I can't stress enough how much, I, I mean, I just, I really think that is so. And yeah. I happen to know what an amazing um, support your your mom um, was for you yeah. throughout every, this a whole, whole path. Uh, yeah, she was my later. rock. Amazing. She was my rock. And uh, interestingly enough, tomorrow was her birthday. She would have been 75. Mm, happy so, birthday, mom. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And, and I have a picture. I have I have a pic, an eight and a half by 11 picture just to the left of my screen of my mom. So I figured that would help me not be so nervous. Can you show, do you want to show us? I don't know if I can here. Honor mom. Mom passed away recently. Oh, beautiful mom. Oh, mm, happy birthday. So good. <laughs> um. Okay. So appreciate that. Nobly, anything else you want to chime in? 
I just, um, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm in awe by everything, not in awe, but like everything that Christina's, you know, she's gone through all of this stuff and she's had all these barriers and all this trauma. And um, one of my questions, you know, was going to be like, how are you doing now? And it makes me so happy to hear that, you know, that you're in remission and you, you know, you still, you still go through things, but it's and not to make light of anything that you're going through, but how, how, um, how much hope, you know, that you, that you spread by your story and by, you know, letting people, you know, know that despite all of that, look at you, like you're beautiful, you're successful, like you have this amazing book and that you're, you're here with us to share, you know, all of that to just even to reach one person. I have like goosebumps right now, but just to be able to, you know, reach one person. And, and that's, you know, that's, you know, why we're all here. And, um, and I'm sorry that, you know, that you had to go through all of that to get where you are now on that end. But on this end, I'm so grateful, you know, that you are where you are now. And, and wow. same with, same with Megan and, and myself. And I just wanted to touch on something that Megan had said that was so true and such a barrier for me was, um, being able to have the same um, therapist, you know, through different kinds of methods of therapy. But here was my plight being, you know, a, a very uh, poverty stricken, you know, addicted, uh, even before addiction, just, you know, just needing help. Here right. was what, here was my plight was um, I would go in and often when I finally could get on the organ health plan and, and could get, you know, get to the, the mental health office. Um, most often when you rely on the county, you know, the county mental health um, places, and I'm, I'm, please don't think that I'm bad mouth and I'm just trying to say this so that a change could potentially be made. But what often I ran into was I never got, the, often never got the same person. And so I don't want to come back in here and my, you know, one hour allotted, tom, allotted time slot and try to break it down for you. Right. It's I just want, I yeah. just want the person I've already broken it down to, to be able to relieve some of the shit that's going on in here today. Right. You right. know, and, and so that was a huge thing for me that, and then even I finally got a, um, a, an amazing mental health prescribing, you know, psychiatrist. And then he, you know, without zip of a notice he was on to better things and then I was here with this person that I wasn't vibing with in any way shape or form yeah. and so it and it's and in, and that was as a grown woman like it's even more traumatic for for children in my personal opinion to to have um consistency with these people these counselors school counselors you know wherever they're coming across with these because most of them are lacking consistency in their life anyway, yeah. you know? So yeah. I just yeah. wanted to, um, to touch on that a little bit. And, um, you know, on a positive note, um, it, you know, it did take me not quite as long as Christina, but it took me six years to find the right combination of medication um, and for dosages. myself and, the and dosages. And yeah, yeah six, six years and six hell ridden treacherous, yeah you know, years. And, um, I, um, uh, my bipolar two, you know, is still here and it's still around and I'm still depressed and I still have PTSD and stuff, but I found, um, um, Oh, well, I'm three years clean and sober the other day. I had three years, but anyway, I, I find, I find, um, that, my manics are like so separated out so, so much further, mm -hmm. you know, than they've ever been. Like they still happen and they still are really bad for the, you know, the four days that, that they, they do last, but um, I'm grateful that, that they don't last as long. And so, and all of that, um, you know, uh, hell to get to write stuff, um, I mean, it wasn't for nothing because now I do, I am on the right one and I do feel, feel better. But yeah. a lot of the road from hell to here um, was unnecessary. Yeah. Well, it really and, and, was. Mm -hmm. 
Well, let's talk more. Well, let's talk more, um, a little bit more about that. And again, it's, it's not about trying to beat up the system. What it's about right. is, is looking for opportunities for improvement. Um, and Christina, um, curious would you talk with i mean i know you've already kind of gone into it's hard to talk with the about the good without talking about exactly. what's been not helpful but yeah. are there other things too that you would like to to point out that were not helpful yes. that we should okay yeah <laughs> yeah okay so first and foremost one major unhelpful thing it's what we've already discussed not having access to care um, it's absurd to me that in this country, even if you have health insurance, you still can't get help. Mm -hmm. um, it's been an ongoing battle for me to find a psychiatrist that will take Medicare. I mean, mm -hmm. and it just seems kind of wrong to me. Mm -hmm. um, another example of something not very helpful, but severely traumatizing was when I was first in restraints and ignored at the hospital. I, am, I called out for help to the extent for hours to the extent that I lost my voice um I didn't know where I was um I was tied up in restraints I thought I was going to be raped or murdered I had no idea where I was and if someone in that hospital just one person had shown some compassion come into my room tell me why I'm there tell me why I'm tied up that would have really eased my suffering, but that is not what happened. Another um, example of something unhelpful was a clinic that I found back in uh, 2013. This was after my longtime psychiatrist had passed away. So I was scrambling to find another provider, you know, again, stressing, couldn't find one provider in my city that would take Medicare. So I finally found this clinic called Northwest Mental Health. And um, that's not its real name, but it's what I call it in the book. And it was my only option because nowhere else would accept my Medicare. So I had to go to this clinic. Um, it was cold and impersonal. Um, they rarely returned phone calls. They only saw patients every three months and they just didn't seem to care very much. And an actual practitioner at that clinic made such a big medication mistake that it would trigger my last relapse and it would ruin my life for almost three years. Wow. So clinics like that are not helpful. And I'd like to see it shut down personally. Wow. It, it, it shut down and some's got to be in its place though, right? I mean, that's the I only one. It, well, it's the only clinic that I found in my city that will accept Medicare. Yeah. Uh, there are, there are more resources for people on Medicaid, but for mm -hmm. some reason I don't qualify for Medicaid, even though like, it doesn't make any sense why I don't qualify for Medicaid because I'm on Medicare. Um, right. And I've never been given a good answer as to why I don't qualify for Medicaid. Mm -hmm. But there are a little more resources, at least in my area, for people on Medicaid. But if you have Medicare, you're screwed. Wow. Wow. So. Yeah. And do you find at all um, that there's more? help now i mean uh, as an unintended you know as consequence. a consequence i guess for from the pandemic um you know or, or a happy accident from the pandemic it seems like that there's more options at least for some people to be able to get remote care have you found that that has impacted your options at all um, or is medicare still really limiting Medicare is still really limiting. I have a psychiatrist now who lives up north and in the bigger city. Um, and he accepts Medicare and we do virtual visits. So I don't even see him in person. So that's really helpful. And he's been my psychiatrist for like two or three years now. Um, he's great. Um, awesome. So, yeah. 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 Um, it, now, this is, you know, totally off too. But, you know, one of the things that I keep thinking of is, you know, I will oftentimes tell kind of my my horror stories about this, which I talked a little bit about earlier. Um, and then I think about people who may be sitting there wondering, you know, should I reach out? You know, should I try to get help myself? And 
like I worry sometimes that I'm discouraging someone for reaching out for help. And like, I don't want to do that. I want right. people to try. I just also want the system to do better. Right. Um, it needs to be better. And like, um, I, this is kind of going off the discussion guide, but it's fine. You know, I really dream of a day when the mental health system is rebuilt and evolves into a system with compassion, understanding, and education at its core. Mm, uh, mm. No one should ever have to suffer in restraints alone or terrified for their life with no one in a hospital that cared enough to help. This stuff needs to be abolished. And I totally believe that it starts with these conversations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I can't agree with you more, you know, and in fact, I, I keep feeling like people who struggle um, with all sorts of different mental health conditions, whether, you know, it's PTSD or bipolar one or um, schizophrenia, you know, whatever it is that we are often, you know, times like othered or kind of, you know, set aside and, and not looked at as equals. And I'm like, man. Well, no, we're not. And we're oh. not. I've, I've had so many experiences where I have not been treated like a, a human being. Right, Just right. Thrown away like trash because they don't see us as real people. Right. They see we us as having some sort of weakness of character or something that is right. not a medical condition. Right. Which is why um, for so long, I never talked about what I go through. Um, and it had to hide. And frankly, it got worse and worse because of, of trying to, to hide it, trying to wow. be quote unquote normal, whatever the fuck that is. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and realize, you know, that just sent me further into isolation when I was struggling, which doubled down on, on how difficult that was started that the shame, like nobly, you talked about this, this early that layers on top of it. If I can just feel when, when I have felt free as I do now, um, to talk about, uh, my experiences, and others have the courage to talk about theirs too. I've discussed, you know, there are so many of us dealing with these same issues and afraid to talk about them, especially some 20 years ago when it was really, really taboo uh, to talk about it. And so you feel, um, you know, worse and worse and, um, and, 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 and then have more negative impacts on, on your life. And so I feel like when we are able to open up, speak more freely about it, we actually heal more quickly. We also find Absolutely. that we're not so strange because every other person out there is dealing with some, you know, version, their own version of, of what we're talking about here, here too. Um, and so, and for me, I don't know about y'all, but feeling less alone, um, is really it's priceless. powerful. It's priceless. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why I, this conversation is important to me because the mental health and criminal justice system failed me. Yeah. And, um, it, we got to change. Yeah, we cannot keep treating people with mental health issues like animals or dogs or people that aren't even people. Yeah, keeping so, someone in solitary confinement and stuff like that. It's not right. okay. So you talked about a few things: um, compassion, right? Treating as like full human beings, right? Even if we're suffering, um, right. it doesn't mean we're weak. Uh, and in fact, my experience is those of us who are, are suffered deeply like um, each of us have, we are powerful, really amazing human beings. Uh, and um, so um, so quite the opposite uh, of weak. So, yeah. so understanding the whole human compassion, I'm thinking about what are other kind of ingredients that we need? Education. Um, education. Especially, uh, for, especially for law enforcement. Okay. So that's what I was going to ask. Education I, for whom is it and, and about what? I think, I don't know. I think that maybe people who work in psych hospitals need more education because I don't know. It's just really bizarre that they ignored me for so long. Um, well, I don't know. 
Well, honestly, I, I think it's an interesting, so here's the last piece that I actually wrote about that I think is relevant here to this point is that there's this certain training, it seems like even, um, I like mentioned the, the DSM uh, and just thinking about how we think about mental health conditions. And yes. there are some, um, you know, biological, you know, chemical um, uh, conditions by no means makes us, you know, less than or, right. or something to be, to be other and, and to, and to really, to be able to think about the, the whole person, especially once, you know, now that there are these amazing medications that allow you to, to your full self to come out Absolutely. Uh, and not just that. the illness. Yeah. I never thought that I would be normal again. Yeah. I, yeah. I really was like, this is my, going to be the rest of my life. And yeah. when I took the Latuda, I was like, no way this is, yeah. And I, it goes to a question that, or something you were saying earlier, I think it's taken me time to adjust to happiness because I haven't had it in so long. And also when I have been happy in the past, it's been ripped away and my whole life's been destroyed right. because of bipolar. And so I'm like nervous about the happiness because it's like, when is it going to be ripped away? When am I going to go to jail again or something right. like that, you know? Well, and that goes to that, that additional point that is going to make too, because also those of us who have mental, uh, suffer with various mental health conditions because of trauma, because of violations against us by other people, because, or even by, um, you know, horrible accidents, uh, like my daughter's death, there's no fault of our own, but the, but this, the failure of our social systems, um, to come in to, to help um, ease that, that place, right. To help feel more confident, uh, in life. And that is, that's a real thing. And the way I think that we have really looked at people who are suffering from those conditions as somehow being less than yes. rather than, rather than looking at the society that has created those conditions in the first place. And yes. that's where the less than is. And I really, my dream <laughs> here, as we're dreaming a little bit, um, is that we actually find ways um, to make those changes, right? right? And that we take responsibility and for for one another, and also hold hold offenders more accountable, right. um, and and be and and actually do take the steps to um, put our arms out uh, right. for people who are suffering to whether I know you or not to make sure I have Narcan in my purse to, you know, help, you know, save that life to, you know, reach out to, you know, to notice uh, when somebody is, is struggling and just check in and be willing to have those conversations with people so that we can rebuild that trust. And anyway, I, I okay. my soapbox there. <laughs> Something that's Good. would be ideal for me. And I don't know if it is policy at certain hospitals, but something very important to me and dear to my heart is that when someone is put in restraints um, for a mental health crisis, it'd be great if it was hospital policy to allow either a counselor, a family member, or a friend to come in and sit with that person while they're in restraints. Mm. That's a mm. real important one to me. Mm. That would be great if, if hospitals were to do that. Yeah. Because, and if, go ahead if they would actually like, yeah, reach out, um, to, uh, right. Not just rely on a family member, you know, right. <laughs> so uh, allow it and actually reach out to, to support system to attempt right. to find out who an emergency contact might be, um, who somebody that you trust might be, um, right. and to, to call, call that person, uh, in to be there. I love that. I love that. You know, another thing that um, I was recently doing a project where I got to talk to um, somebody who does, um, provides mental health services for uh, queer youth, um, uh, youth and youth of color, and um, talking about how oftentimes in, in our society, the, the generational trauma, the just societal trauma, the way people are, are treated. I mean, there's some real new, um, newly resurfacing 
um, fears and threats uh, to LGBTQ uh, community members. Um, and, you know, that affects somebody's um, mental health as well. Like Nobly, you were talking to before, like, there was something going on with me and no one, um, you know, bothered to ask. They just assumed that I'm acting out and, you know, I'm a bad, you know, a quote unquote bad kid. And, you know, if we could, <laughs> uh, and I love the, this person I was interviewing, he was saying, he's like, we really need to, to, to flip how we are thinking about about mental health and mental health care um, and helping to, um, for people who are suffering like that to, to normalize it and to realize, oh, it's actually normal for you to be reacting this way to these horrible right. circumstances that you right. think. And, um, oh, right. And, you know, so people can, so you feel less of that um, self blame and shame, shame. And, you yeah. know, all that stuff that, that comes up that, yeah, honestly, at least for me, it was hard for me to get to healing without, uh, until I could get through that sense of shame. Um, and so, and, and have a real clear sense that the stuff I've been through, um, I, <laughs> it is absolutely normal, um, how I reacted. Uh, it would actually be, it would actually be, I think, abnormal if you did not PTSD. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> From everything, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's my big dream is, is, is to flip the, the system on, on its head and to yes. look for that, um, uh, just the more whole whole system response. I know we're coming here uh, to to the end of of our time, but let's um, maybe go around and see if there's any like kind of final dreams or wishes or those kind of key ingredients that we we or any final points that we each want to to share um, uh, about. Yeah mental health, our experiences or recommendations for it, however you want to want to wrap up. Um, who wants to go first? I'll go first. Okay. Um, so um, a couple of dreams of mine would be um, that there was mental health court everywhere. Yes. And that and and that the um, and that the people um, like Christina and so many other that have have been um, wrongfully treated um, during an arrest and in uh, any other situations because of the severity of their untreated mental health or the episode that are in or whatever that may look like. There has to be things put in place, laws put in place and, and stuff to protect us, you know, um, people with mental health disorders um, from getting all these legality and all these legal charges pressed against and that is not okay. That is not okay. My dream is that that is all wrapped up and taken care of and in supportive of the mental health. Truly, truly do the research, truly understand what mental health is like. This is where the education piece comes in. Find out what, what you're talking about and make the laws according and make mental health according and support people with mental health because it is a disease. It's not something that we choose. It is something that we have from various traumatic reasons and various reasons why. So that is a huge wish. And my wish is to have more free time so that I can be a volunteer hugger. And if I could, <laughs> Straight up. If I could, I would go to the, the psychiatric hospitals. I would go to the homeless shelters and I would go to the mental health crisis centers and I would hug the shit out of everybody that wanted one. I love you so much, yeah. Nobly. Straight up. I'm coming in hot and I'm hugging the shit out of everyone that I can because that's what we need. Some love, compassion, and fucking tenderness. Yeah. <laughs> Mic drop, you know. <laughs> so you get me fired. <laughs> That's what's up. Sorry, it's your turn, Christina. I just, yeah, yeah, that was boiling inside me. Here you go, girl. <laughs> oh, I, I would say I don't have a whole lot of a whole lot left to say about it, but um, it would be great if there was more funding for free clinics. Um, again, the mindset that we are real people 
who struggle with something medical, um, you know, more access to care, uh, more conversations like these. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, it's just, it's just been a real shit show for me for, for a long time. And I would love to see things change. I really would. Uh, but again, I would like to see hospital policy change. So when people are in restraints that they're not ignored. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. I think I have confidence in humanity and I think that we can do better. Yeah, we can do better. This does not need to be occurring in 2023. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. even in the 1800s, people who were insane were taken to sanitariums and chained up and all that. And I'm, you know, definitely we've come further. Yeah, uh, from yeah. that, but we still have a long way to go because there's a lot of cruelty in the system. Yeah. And part of me, I know this sounds crazy, but I'm not really a big fan of Big Brother. But if we have to put hidden cameras in these hospitals, make sure people cave, then maybe we should do that temporarily. Mm. It's kind mm. of, mm. it's big brother, but well, I hey, know what else to do to stop people from being treated like shit. At, yeah, at hospitals. this point, let's put it all, let's put all the ideas on, on the table, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the really great things, I think, is thinking about the progress, right? We really, these kinds of conversations really didn't happen 20 years ago. So the fact that we are able to to now talk about these things, I think it does give the opportunity um, to make more of the improvement. So putting all these ideas out on the table, um, I mean, let's not censor any of them. Let's just put them out there and and then think through. Okay, well, right. how how can we deal with you know the unintended, unintended consequences that maybe maybe come with those things, like the the Big Brother part of it? Um, but what you're looking for is that accountability, right? right. And the responsibility, and ideally, we wouldn't have to get go that far, right? Because people would, um, you know recognize their own burnout in their situations or maybe maybe there's care for the care more care for the caregivers so they are able to maintain that compassion uh okay. on a daily basis right showing up to or you know more um support for bringing more people into that system so that you know folks can take a day off when because caregivers are human beings too right yeah and and uh, and and sh need to be able to stay home and take care of themselves um when those things come up so it doesn't negatively impact the people that they're supposed to be caring for um and yet if you have um not enough people to to fill jobs people are showing up and working just exhausted and not well cared for themselves it's it's just not gonna be good for anybody um so um so good stuff there um i'll just add my my last my last little little dream here um for myself um is that i know um i could use continued access to emergency care um plus uh, a consistent check-in uh and by the way the can you do access to emergency care. I don't believe I'm in need of any imminent need of that, but I, it does me good knowing that's there. Should yes. I, I stumble and fall? Should something get triggered and I have a really rough day and feel like I just need that, that quick private, you know, conversation. I don't know. I, I mean, and who knows circumstances change for people um, all right. the time. And, um, just knowing that that's out there is, is, um, is a relief to me. Um, plus to keep me from needing that emergency care is consistent check-in, uh, with a therapist or, um, and, or really, uh, a trauma informed or trauma experienced coach, exactly. um, on a regular, like on a, at least on a monthly basis for me, like I'm, I need it to be in proper balance. Like I live a full life, but if I was able to check in with somebody monthly, um, that 
that would really work uh, well for me. And it, and the consistent part is important because I don't want to have to re-explain myself. My story is complicated and um, I don't want to have to spend several um, several um, sessions just yeah. getting to the point where I can finally <clears throat> um, talk about it, what it, I need to talk about now. Thank you. Um, right. right. And then finally that, that I have enough money uh, or insurance or an EAP uh, coverage or, or, someone or, who will, or someone who will accept your insurance or it's someone who will accept my insurance, someone who <laughs> it works for me. Right. Honestly, I think everybody, if you have insurance, everybody should accept that. I, I understand there's some barriers there. I actually want to have another episode on where we actually talk yes. about that particular issue because I yeah. think it's a biggie. And I'd like to yeah. talk with some providers about that and and what's messed up on that end that, that right. providers don't take um, all insurance that's out there because it, that's that's just, it's hard enough to find somebody that works for you and then to know that they may not take accept your insurance is um i mean it's cr it can be crushing uh to the person seeking help um and you know and and actually i i just having some plain uh free care because you know many of us don't and can't even afford insurance these days so um i don't think any yeah. of us should ever have to choose between that um, mental health care and eating well, paying for our housing needs, um, being connected to uh, the, uh, our own personal support systems and, and other things that, that are just basics. So um, yeah, so <laughs> it seems like it shouldn't be a tall order, but it feels like it as I say it. So on that note, let's wrap up, Christina. Um, thank you so much for being here, for being Thanks so- for having me. Mm -hmm. being so open and candid uh, with your story and generous. And I do hope you'll come back. Um, I will. I'll yeah. be back. Yeah. Yes. I was going to say the same thing. It was, it was a pleasure to get to meet you and to have you on here. And I see, I see you in the future because <laughs> yeah. we, we still have lots of, you know, yeah, stuff. good and conversations to have. Yeah. Good conversations to have. So and, thank and, you. And all y'all listening out there, um, know we'll be back in two weeks uh, to talk about hope uh, and how we find hope. I'm just really excited for that one. That one, by the way, is going to wrap up uh, this first season mm -hmm. of On Surviving. So holy yeah. moly, I can't believe we're already there. That's but really. Exciting. Yeah, really excited to, to wrap up um, on that note. Um, but for now, uh, we will close with our first two medicines, water and laughter. And we will start <laughs> start with laughter, nobly. Okay, this is like dad joke goofiness, but um, <laughs> what kind of cheese is my cheese? <laughs> what? Nacho cheese. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I love we needed a good laugh after no, all no. the serious of for, for real. And my partner. My partner. I, I, I yeah. did I did promise I would also drum roll. <laughs> I did promise I would also bring a dad joke today. And in fact, okay. I brought three jokes. Two oh, short ones yeah. and a long okay. one. You ready? Okay. Yes. Joke, joke, joke. Joke. <laughs> <Okay. Alrighty. laughs> <laughs> oh, <I can't> <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm kidding. I'm laughing really hard. <laughs> See? Oh. Mission accomplished. Christina, do you have water? It's okay if you don't. Yeah. Uh, cheers. cheers. Water is life, my friends. Have yes. a good night. Take care, everybody. Thanks Take for care being of with yourselves, us. everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>